for his word. And the big question is, do you believe it today? I hope you do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's go to our Bibles today and turn to John 3. I'm going to kind of depart from my series I've been doing on the fruit of the Spirit for one week. And we're going to go into the greatest mission text of the Bible. And we're going to take a look at a verse that's very familiar to all of us, but look at it from a little bit different perspective today, from the perspective of missions. And I want to speak on this subject today, the greatest mission text in all the Word of God. Get your Bible, if you would, and turn to John chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. John chapter 3 and verse 14 in God's Word today, and I'm finding my way there. I'm trusting that you will as well. John chapter 3, verse 14. 14. Let's stand together out of respect for God's Word to read the Bible today. And then we're going to get right into this subject today. I think you'll find the Lord will speak to your heart today. I hope that your heart is open to the Holy Spirit today. John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth on in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten. Son of God. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of God's Word today. Father, we come to you today with deep dependency upon the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know your Word was given by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we know that it will not, it will not have an impact on our lives today unless the Spirit of God does a work in our heart. And so, Lord, we come to you today humbly before your Word, trembling before your Word, and Lord, we pray, dear God, that you would speak, speak to our hearts. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we approach John chapter 3, it's a very familiar passage to anyone who's been saved any amount of time at all. I think it's familiar with the wonderful truths contained within this great text of Scripture. And yet sometimes I think we often look at John 3.16 simply from the man word side of it rather than sometimes from the God word side of it. So today we're going to look at it from the context of missions. And particularly we're going to focus in on, though I gave you a lot of verses in the context, we're going to focus in on that great verse, John 3.16. Uh, by the way, there have been multitudes of great messages preached on that verse. Only heaven will reveal the number of sinners that have been saved after hearing John chapter 3, verse 16. And so what a great text it is. I want you to notice, first of all, as we approach this text today from the standpoint of missions, I want you to see that missions does not begin with man. It begins with God. Amen. I want you to look here, and my first point this morning is this, that God is the master planner of this great work of missions. Notice, if you would, in John 3, 16, let's just look at two verses. The Bible are two words for God. For God. Think about those words and then think about the words in connection with it. For God so loved the world. That to me is the foundation of all evangelistic and all mission work in the world. And that's the reality that God loves the world. A world that is lost in sin. In fact, get your Bible if you would and let's look at a companion passage. Turn to the book of 1 John with me. The little book of 1 John. And I love this. 1 John chapter 2. And we'll look at a couple of verses here in the Word of God that really go along with what is said here in John chapter 1. I'm going to give you several verses that I want you to jot down and think about as we're preaching on the fact that missions originates in the very heart of God. Missions originates in the very heart of God. The book of 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says, My little children, these things write unto you, they you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now here's the key. And He is the propitiation for our sins. The believer, amen? But not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Think about that today. Why did God devise a plan of salvation? He did it for His glory, amen? Ultimately, evangelism and missions is for the glory of God. 
But the beneficiary of that blessing is you and I that are saved. Amen? Because you and I make up that, that mission field called the world. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself today in my preaching. But God himself is the author of missions. You see, so often we look at man's need and, and we see God simply responding to man's need. But that's really not what missions is all about. You know that before we ever had a need, God moved. Amen. God was the one that authored salvation. I want you to see several passages today that we're going to look at on the subject of God who is the author of missions. He is the master planner of missions. And I want you to look in your Bible, first of all, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to notice verses 2 through 6. And we're going to take a little bit of time with each of these passages today on my very first point, which is God is the author of missions. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. It is a part of God's eternal plan that God would reconcile you and I to Himself. And that's really what missions is all about. It's about seeing lost sinners reconciled to a holy God. I enjoyed a testimony that I heard in Sunday school this morning. Of course, many of you knew the fields were gone on a, on a cruise and they found themselves down in Honduras. And while they were there, Matt Mike shared this testimony this morning that they met some ladies in Honduras who were selling some things to the tourists. And she began to witness with them and discovered that they themselves had been converted to Jesus Christ by the work of a Baptist missionary Amen. right there in Honduras. Aren't you glad that missionaries go and they preach the gospel? And they hand out some tracts, and a young boy took those tracts and began to share them with others. Well, you know, he was becoming a missionary himself, wasn't he, as, as Chris was handing out these tracts. Praise God for the work of missions. You look here in Ephesians chapter 1, though, it began in the heart of God himself. Ephesians 1, look with me if you would in verse 2. The Bible says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. May I remind you today that we're not just going to heaven if we're saved. We're already there. Amen. If I'm in Christ this morning, and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, as far as God is concerned, I've already arrived. What a blessing. Amen. And so if you, if you truly are in Christ, and you're in His body, that means today that you and I are blessed with he in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to see here the work of redemption, the work of missions, according as He has chosen us in Him. I, I'm not ashamed of the fact that God calls His people His elect. We have been chosen by God. We have been chosen in Christ, and look what it says, before the foundation of the world. Do you understand that long before God's created work that took place on this planet we call earth, that God in His mind and His heart throughout all of eternity had designed this great work of redemption of mankind? In fact, even before Adam and Eve made the faithful choice to sin, which literally placed all of mankind into sin and depravity, God had the solution before there was a problem, amen? And that solution was His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to me, that's such a beautiful truth in the Word of God, to know that God had me in His heart and His mind throughout all of eternity, long before I was conceived, long before I was born, God had devised the means whereby I could be reconciled and be redeemed and be brought into an eternal relationship with Himself. You see, missions begins in the very heart of God. The Bible says here that we've been chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Having predestined us of the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. You say, well, why did He do it? Well, there's a reason right here in this verse. According to the good pleasure of His will. Just simply because it brought God joy. Amen? The Bible says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and despised the shame and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. For his own good pleasure. Amen. You know, asking why God redeemed lost sinners is kind of like asking a family why they had kids. Amen. I want to tell you something. My children have been a great joy to me. And I'm thankful to God that through the marriage that God brought my wife together and I, that God has blessed us with children. And it's brought great joy and great pleasure to our lives to have children. And now we're at that stage where we're having even more joy and pleasure through grandchildren. You see, the same things that bring us joy brings God joy. And the Bible says that the joy that was set before Him caused Him to endure the cross and to despise the shame. So missions begins 
with the heart of God. We need to see missions from the God work standpoint for God so loved the world. I want you to also look at another text I think you'll find interesting. Get your Bible, if you will, with me and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And this text certainly goes along with this same theme that I'm sharing with you today. In fact, if I were to give you every text, we, we would be here all day. But I'll give you a few as we look at the God, and God being the author of missions. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. I think we're very familiar with this verse as well. Verse 18 says, For as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. And I want to remind you today, if you're here without Christ, money will not buy your way into heaven. Amen? I've met people who were convinced that they would just give enough money to enough benevolent causes that somehow God would wink his eye and open up heaven's door. And I want to say this, if you could buy your way into heaven, the cross was a travesty. The cross was an unnecessary event in history if there was some other way to be saved. No, money will not purchase your way to heaven. It might get you on an airplane to fly somewhere, amen. It might, it might open your door into a, into a play or a movie, but it's not going to get you into heaven. The Bible says we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. The Bible says receive from the vain conversation or tradition of your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. And I can say this today without apology. That there is nothing on this, on this world, in this world or in this universe that is of more value than the blood of Jesus. Because it's only the blood of Christ that has the ability to cleanse the sinner's soul and make them whole again. But look what the Bible says in verse 20. Who verily was foreordained. Now look what it says before the foundation of the world. That tells me that missions was in the heart of God even before we were created. Even before we were born, it was a part of God's eternal purpose that He would redeem mankind unto Himself. What a blessing. Amen. And the Bible says that Jesus was foreordained uh, before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times. You ever thought about the blessing it is to live after Christ rather than B.C.? Amen. You see, in the Old Testament, they by faith were looking forward one day to the day the Messiah would come. But they had no idea when he would come. And of course, by faith, they looked forward. They would bring their sacrifices. And those sacrifices provide a temporary atonement or covering for their sin. But you see, many lived and died and did not see the Messiah come. What a joyous day it was when Jesus came in the world. Amen? Light came in the darkness. And as a result of that, we now can look back to Calvary and know that there's an event that took place in history. And that event, the Son of God died on the cross in our place, but it did not end on a lonely cross on Calvary. Amen. Right. Thank God that He conquered the grave. And Jesus Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. Wherefore also the Bible says He is able to save unto the uttermost them and that come unto God by Him. We can look back. We can proclaim to a lost world that Christ has come. He's died. He's been buried. He's risen again. He's paid the sin debt. He's said the words that He's finished. And He's conquered the grave. And they just simply must come to Him, repent of their sins, and believe on the gospel. Amen? What a blessing to live in A.D. rather than living in B.C. And so we see here the greatest, uh, the greatest author of missions is God Himself. I want you to notice, second of all, the greatest motivation for missions is love. For God so loved who? The world. You know, we, we naturally love those who love us back. It's easy to love my wife because she's very kind. She loves me back. Amen? It's easy to love my children because in most cases they love me back. It's easy to love grandkids. Amen? They love to hug me and they love to kiss me and they like to see me. Amen? It's easy to love people who love you back. You know something who it's hard to love is your enemies. Right. Jesus said love your enemies. It says pray for those that, that curse you and those who despitefully use you. But that's a whole other story. Think about this. Because of sin, because of depravity, we live in a world that is an enemy of God. You know, when we do door-to-door -door evangelism, which I, I personally love, I enjoy going out and spreading the gospel, handing out tracts, you never know who you're going to meet. And you never know whether someone is going to get a tract and it's going to change the course of their eternity. Amen? And to me, it's just a great thing to be involved in missions right here in, in our Jerusalem, Kokomo, right here, and to be involved in that great work. But you know, sometimes you meet some people that do not appreciate the fact that you knock on their door, amen? 
In other words, it's easy to love those that are receptive to you. We were out knocking doors yesterday and met a lady and she came out and just fellowship with us. Just open up the Word of God sort of verbally with one another. And we were able to edify and encourage others. Well, we were on another street not on doors and we met someone who was not nearly as friendly as that. Amen? Well, what I'm saying today is this. You look at our God. Our God loves people who do not love Him back. That's the great love of God. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. And I think about Saul. Saul was an enemy of God. Saul was persecuted. He was killing Christians. But here's the truth. God loves Saul. Amen? And the Lord appeared to him one day on the road to Damascus. And Saul's life was eternally changed. And we know it was Paul because his life was so changed, God even changed his name. And Paul became the greatest missionary of the first century. Why? Because of the love of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. And God's love is so much different than our love. We love the lovely. We love those who love us back. But God loves the unlovely. God loves those who have no capacity to love Him back. And so we find here the greatest motivation for missions. And you may wonder, as you meet these missionaries this week, and you say, how in the world would you leave the comforts of America and go to an impoverished nation like Haiti and go there and live and have to sacrifice? Why would you do that? Well, I believe it's love that must motivate the missionary. Amen? You see, we see from missions in John 3, 16, the greatest motive for missions is love. I referred a little bit this morning in Sunday school to a dear lady who's a very good friend of ours. And for many years, her and her husband were involved in ministry up in Kalakaska, Michigan. And her husband came down with terminal cancer and passed away about 15 years ago. Well, as a, as a, as a widow now, she wondered, what am I going to do with the rest of our life? And Norman Bruton, she made the decision, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go and serve the Lord. You know something? She was in her 60s, late 60s, when her husband passed away. But she spent 15 years in Kenya, Africa, ministering to little children and, and being involved in missions. Well, you know something? What a blessed woman. Amen? In other words, because she had... And you say, why would a woman leave the comforts of America? And she'd been a pastor's wife and for the most part had a life of ease. Why would you go to an impoverished and difficult country like Kenya, Africa and go and spend your life serving Jesus Christ? There's only one answer to that, and it's called love. Amen? It's the love of God. I want you to look in your Bible at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul in this text shares several things that motivate him and moved him in his life. And there's no greater motivation in all the world than love. You know, the great love chapter says, Now by these three, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity, right? Amen? I think we're familiar with those passages. We'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look what Paul wrote here by divine inspiration in this great text of God's Word. Chapter 5. Look what Paul said in verse 14. You see, we're talking about the motivation. Love is the greatest motivation. God so loved the world. The Bible tells us here in verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth me. Now, I love that word constraineth. Amen? How many of you enjoy grape juice? I enjoy good grape juice. It's fresh. Or anything else that is that is pressed right out of the of the of the natural and the fresh bounty of this earth, the fruits of this earth. And you know, if you think about this, the word constraint. My wife and I have a, a, a thing we use sometimes when we're canning and so forth, called a Victoria strain. You ever heard one before? Where you put the things in there, whether it be tomatoes or grapes or whatever, and you begin to run that handle, and it begins to crush them and it removes what's bad. But it leaves what's good and wholesome. Amen? And we begin to enjoy that. Well, you know, that's what the word constraint means. It literally means to put something in a press. What Paul is saying right here, when I hear how much that God loved me, when I realize how much He cared about me and the great sacrifice He was willing to make on Calvary and my behalf, and I began to contemplate His love, I just couldn't keep it to myself. It began to press something out of me. Amen? That's why missionaries go, amen, is because of God's love. It's not their love. The reality is it's God's love that is flowing through them. The book of Romans says that the love of God is shed upon the heart. You know, have you ever known people that go to a particular mission field and they go to a field that really you don't have a burden for? For instance, I've worked for many years as a missionary reaching offenders. There are people that are locked up for their faith. They're not the easiest people to love, I'll guarantee it. But you know something, if God loves them through you, that makes a huge difference. Amen? And you know, here's the thing. 
Now, when offenders get saved, they become just as beautiful of Christians Amen. as people who have never violated the law or been locked up in jail. Amen? When they genuinely are born again, they can make a great impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. And so they themselves <coughs> can become missionaries. So we look here at, at this passage of 2 Corinthians. And the Bible says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because thus we judge that if one died for all, that all were dead. And look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live to themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I'm telling you, the greatest motivation for missions is the love of God for a lost and dying world. For God so loved the world. I want you to notice thirdly the mission field itself. The mission field. Look back to John chapter 3. You say, well, Pastor, what is the mission field from God's standpoint? The whole world. The whole world. The cosmos. Amen? This world. This world is evil and is sinful and is depraved and is as detestable as sometimes it is to us as believers that it's filled with sinners. And you know, if you look at our world today, it's busting wide open. Right. I mean, you look at our world that's going on in the Middle East and sabers are rattling, wars and rumors of wars are taking place. This world has never been a place of peace. And if you know your Bible, if you know Revelation, it's not going to end with world peace. Mm. I know there are those who have envisioned bringing about a world utopia. And there are people who have that as their goal. But it's never happened in our lifetime. And it will never happen until Jesus comes. Amen? This world's always going to be a place of sin. Jesus said, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not even of your lusts that bore in your members? Why is the world filled with greed and suffering and sorrow and pain? And you know, I really think that God's, God's complaint department is not open for Christians, amen, in America, okay? Right. When I look at what Christians are going through around the world, do you realize in Syria that Christians are being butchered right now for their faith? Do you realize that, that this a terrorist organization in Iraq has been butchering and killing Christians and they're suffering, being driven from their homes, even as I'm speaking on this very day? Thankfully, at least we had some courage here this past week and sent forth and dealt with some of those terrorists speedily and, and needfully in the Middle East. But what I'm saying is, I don't think the complaint department's open for us as Christians in America when you consider what believers are going through around the world for their faith. Amen? And you begin to get in tune with what many of them are suffering in the hardships, and then we get on our little pity party. I don't, think, I don't think God's too impressed with the things that are bothering us when you think about what many Christians are suffering with in the world. But I'm telling you today, this world that is filled with unrest and sorrow and pain and suffering and war, this is the world that God has sent us to. Amen? You see, missions is all about the field, the mission field. And the mission field, you don't have to go far to get there. It's right outside those doors. The moment you walk out the doors of this assembly, you find the mission, Bill, you know, because there are people outside those doors that do not know Jesus Christ, that have never been born again, that have never understood how to be saved. And it doesn't have to be a jailhouse. It doesn't have to be the rescue mission. There's people all over Kokomo that need Jesus Christ, their Savior. What I'm telling you is the world. You cannot witness to the wrong person. Why? Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Amen. The world is the mission, Bill. You know, that's any individual, whether it be a boy or a girl or a teenager or a man or woman. The mission field is outside the doors of our church. And the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew 28, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word nations is ethnos in the Greek language. And it literally means every tip, every dialect, every, every nation, every language, every tongue. You know, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is that great worship service in heaven. Right. Where they are singing the great song, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. For thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, out of every tongue, and out of every nation. That's what missions is all about. Amen. Why? Because that great choir that's going to take place one day in glory is going to be made up of people from all different nations and nationalities. The body of Christ is beautiful. Amen. Amen. When I think about the numbers of people that make up this beautiful bride of Jesus Christ, this beautiful body of Christ in which every truly born-again, blood-washed believer is a part. And what a joyous thing that's going to be in heaven one day. You know one of the greatest joys will be to know that God used you and me to win precious souls in Jesus Christ. The world is the mission field. We see this in the Word of God. Jesus said in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, He said, But ye shall receive power 
After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. I don't know what Dr. Clarence Sexton says. He says there's no place to stop. Right. And I get contacts from missionaries every week that are going to countries around the world, some of which I've never really heard very much about. But thank God that they're going with the gospel, and they're going to the field. They know where the gospel needs to be preached. I want you to see fourthly today that Jesus Christ, now think about this, was the first missionary. Let's go on to John 3.16. Let's look at that here for a moment. You say, well, who was the first missionary? Well, God is the master planner of missions. But God himself in the person of Jesus Christ became the first missionary in a very real sense to come into this lost world. The Bible says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That tells me that Jesus Christ is the greatest example for mission John will find in your Bible. In John chapter 3, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You know, missions cannot be a reality without giving. Right. Amen? You think about this today. That there would be no missionaries if they were not willing to give their lives to go and do what God has called them to do. But here's something else you need to think about as Christians and here in the church today. Missionaries cannot go if you don't give. Amen? Now I understand we support quite a few missionaries, about 20 families, but even those missionaries we could not support as a church single-handedly. I will guarantee they could not stay on the field if it was just the money that our church gave them. But thank God that we have many churches that partner together and provide through giving the finances that are necessary for a missionary and their family to be on the field and to stay on that field. You know, any army will tell you, anyone that's involved in the army, and my dad was in the army, he will tell you the most important thing about an army is the supply line. Amen? You let soldiers be cut off in enemy territory with no supplies, and I will guarantee you they will not survive for very long. In fact, I would encourage anyone to read, especially you men, you would enjoy reading the book, The Band of Brothers. And it talks about how those men had to come together to survive behind enemy lines. And they'd gone in and they'd been dropped in behind enemy lines. And they were not fighting so much to win the war. They were fighting to preserve one another's lives. Amen. They became a band of brothers. Some wonderful men that took a stand and were heroes from World War II. And they endured the Battle of the Bulge there in, in Boston. Very difficult time. Well, I'm going to tell you, think about your missionaries in the same way that they are soldiers on the foreign field. Amen? We are the supply line. The local church in America, or whatever, whatever country it is that is supplying the, the resources financially for the missionary, we are the ones that are supply line for the missionary. So it's important for you when you give here at the Faith Baptist Church for you to mark and give a portion of your giving to missions because 100% of what you give to missions in this church goes to missionaries and is a direct supply line for them to do the work God's called them to do. But Jesus was the first missionary. Get your Bible and you're right there in the book of John. Look at John chapter 20. We're kind of looking at John 3, 16 from the mission standpoint today. Look with me in John chapter 20. Jesus now has gone to Calvary. He's conquered the grave, praise the Lord. He's assembled with His church. He's in the upper room. And I want you to look at John 20, verse 19. The Bible says that the same day and evening, being the first day of the week. By the way, for those of cultists that will come to you and try to convince you that you need to worship on Saturday instead of on Sunday, Jesus met after His resurrection on the first day of the week. The early church began to meet on resurrection day, the first day, and we are not saved by keeping the law. We are saved through grace by faith. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that today. And God wants us to keep every day holy under the new covenant. Look with me if you would in your Bible. So the first day of the week when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst. You know, He appeared without even coming through the door. Amen. I mean, can you imagine after the events of Calvary, the fear and the trepidation the disciples were going through, and now here they find themselves concealed, kind of hiding and huddled together, and while they're there, not knowing what the next step was they're going to take, Jesus just appears. What a day. Amen. You know, in our lives, He's the same way. There's so many times in my life when I just feel like I'm walled in. Amen. Going through trials and going through tribulations and not knowing what step to take. Praise God, Jesus appears. 
He speaks to us through His Word and by His Spirit. Thank God that Christ appeared. And I want you to notice the conversation. The Bible says in verse 20, When they had so said, He showed unto them His hands and His side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. You can imagine. Verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Aren't you thankful today that we have the peace of God that passes all understanding? Amen. Not peace in the midst of storms. Life is filled with storms, but thank God, Jesus said that in need he might have peace. He says, peace be in you. As my Father, and here's the key, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. You know, there's a very interesting word that is used in our Bible. It is used in the New Testament primarily. That the only place you'll find is the New Testament. It's the word apostle. The word apostle is actually a word that is actually derived from the Greek language. It was transliterated rather than translated into English. In other words, there was no equivalent word in English. So literally what they did, they took the word in Greek and they brought it into English and we become familiar with the word. Now most of the time when you think of an apostle, you think of the twelve, don't you? But you know that Jesus in the book of Hebrews is called the apostle of our profession. Now let's break this down just a little bit today. You know what the word apostle means? Very simply, a sent one. In fact, if you want to expand a little bit broader than that, it means one who has been sent with a commission. One who has been sent with a commission. Do you understand today that Jesus was sent with a commission from his Father into a world that would sin? And in that commission, he would live a sinless life and that he would die a substitutionary death and in that commission, he would come to the grave. And in that commission, he would choose 12 to be with him. And he would send them forth to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you understand that in a very real sense, that every one of us are apostle. Every one of us are a missionary. The Bible says in this passage, he said, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. He said, well, what was his mission? Well, get your Bible if you would and turn to Luke. Turn with me to Luke. He said, what was the mission the Father sent him on? I think we see it in Scripture. If you go back to Luke chapter 4. Jesus quoted now from the Old Testament as he began his public ministry. And I love this because this shows to me and reveals to me what God wants to do in my life and through my life every day. Because as the Father has sent me, Jesus, even so send I you. What is the work of a missionary? Let me show you the work of a missionary in verse 18. Chapter 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. God sent Jesus to preach the gospel. Amen. He sent you and I to preach the gospel. He sent missionaries to preach the gospel. Why? As my Father has sent me, even so sent I you. So number one, to preach the message that transforms lives. Who do we preach it to? The poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. I want to tell you something. We live in a world that is brokenhearted by sin. Do you know that today? And Jesus Christ is the balm of Gilead, and He can heal the broken heart. Amen. Oh, I tell you, He can heal the broken heart. I was walking through Bookend the other day, and I saw a lady, probably in her 70s, who had been arrested. And she was sitting in Bookend, and she was just weeping. I'm telling you, our world is filled with broken heart. People, you said, well, what in the world is a 70-year-old woman? I have no idea why she was there. I can't tell you why she was there, but I can tell you this. My heart was moved as I sat there in Bookie and saw a lady, well up in years, who had been arrested, that's sitting there weeping and just spilling tears on the floor. A broken hearted woman. Amen. What does she need? She needs to have her broken heart bound up by the balls of Gilead. The Bible says to preach deliverance to the captives. You know, I think about many years ago during World War II, the gentleman Arthur, because they were out manned in the Philippines, they had to vacate the Philippines. And many Americans were led on the baton death march to just horrendous conditions within the prison. You know what General MacArthur said before he left? He said, I will return. Amen. And of course those people were headed off and many died during the baton death match and they were held in prison there. But I want to tell you something. It's one of the greatest stories of American history. But one day the Allied forces made their way back to the Philippines and they went there and they liberated those prisoners. And they defeated Japan. And Japan surrendered to the Philippines and the United States. You know the Philippines and the Filipino people still love Americans to this day? Because of the fact that we liberated them from the tyranny of Japan and Japan occupation of the Philippines. 
That's one reason why it's still an open door for a mission field today is because they still have gratitude and appreciation for the fact that we came as a nation and liberated them. You know, that, that was such a joyous day when that prison house was open and the Japanese surrendered and the Americans who had been captives were free. What I'm telling you today is that we have the same kind of a mission today, Christian. Amen? A mission to set the captives free. The captives sometimes are heroin addicts or cocaine addicts. Amen? Sometimes the captives are just people who have been captivated by false religion. We don't know who the captive may be, but I'm telling you this today, that anyone who's never repented of their sins and believed on Jesus Christ as their Savior, they may think that they're free. But in reality, they're a captive today. And the gospel is the liberating message that will liberate the lost sinner. As my Father has sent me, even so I say, you, you see, Jesus Christ was the first missionary. He sets the example for missions. Amen? To send deliverance and preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering the sight of the blind, to set a liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You see, His mission is my mission. It's your mission today. Jesus Christ, the first missionary. What is the message of missions? Well, let's go back to John 3. What is the message of missions? Whosoever believeth. You know, getting saved is not hard. Amen. It's a matter of faith. Back in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 10, we often quote verses 9 to 13, but we forget verse 8. And verse 8 says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, the word of faith which we preach. Amen? <laughs> See what I'm saying today? There's a message of missions, and the message is whosoever believeth. What a blessing we have, and we can share that with people. That if they'll simply come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the message of missions is not a difficult message. It's preaching that we are saved by grace through faith and getting the message. You know, I think about one day when Jesus met that woman, the woman of the well. And there he meets with her. And she has no idea why in the world a Jew would have any dealings with Samaria. But Jesus begins to engage her in conversation. And he says this to the woman. He said, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that's speaking with you, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Amen? You see, Jesus began to share with her two things. Number one, he began to share the gift of eternal life. But he also revealed himself to her. I think it's a beautiful thing that of all the people that Jesus conversed with and talked to during his earthly ministry, that the one that he came right out and told him he was the Messiah was the woman of the world. It wasn't Nicodemus, the theologian. Amen? It was the woman at the well that he revealed. He said, I that speak with you, I am he. What he was saying is, I am the Messiah. And I have a gift for you called eternal life. You know how so many people in the world, all around the world, are just waiting for someone to come and point them to Jesus and to show them that there's a gift called eternal life, that if they will by faith reach out, by faith, and receive it, that they can be forgiven, and that they can spend eternity in a very real heaven because of the message. You see, Jesus was the first missionary. But the message of missions is whosoever believeth. You know, I love the great tract by Dr. Ford Porter called God's Simple Plan of Salvation. God didn't make it hard, amen? He made it easy to be saved. Man makes it hard. And so the message of missions. And then I think about this, the motive for missions. I want you to notice in John 3, 16, the motive for missions shall not perish. Now I tell you today that hell is real. <laughs> The world may scoff, the world may ridicule, the world may not believe in hell, but those words should not perish are very real. And there are people every day dying and going to a Christless eternity without Jesus. And the greatest, one of our greatest motives, and I said that love is the motivation, but the motive for missions are those words, shall not perish. Think about this, every person that responds by faith to the gospel of Jesus Christ not only will not spend eternity in a, in a real place called hell, but they have a future. And by the way, and this is my last point, which is very interesting and maybe seems simple to you, but it's called the mission of missions. Have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. What a blessing because missionaries go. People who were perishing now have a present possession. Amen. And that present possession is eternal life. Look what the Bible says in John 3, verse 36, the very last verse of John chapter 3. You see, we're looking at missions through John 3.16's eyes today. John chapter 3, <laughs> what would be at verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son 
have everlasting life. Are you not thankful and filled with gratitude today that when you believed on the Son, God gave you as a present possession right. everlasting life? Amen. life. And he who believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abide upon him. You see, you think about the motive for missions that shall not perish, but the mission of missions is that they might have everlasting life. Look at John 17. I'll close with this verse today. John chapter 17. Notice verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who now said. That ought to be why we are concerned about giving and praying for and supporting and being involved in missions, is that they might know God, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ. Because that is the very essence of what eternal or everlasting life is all about today. I'm thankful that missions begins not in the heart of man, but it began in the heart of God, for God so loved the world. And I'm glad that I became the object of missions because Jesus Christ saved me by His grace. What about you today? Have you ever experienced the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Have you been saved? And if you have been saved, if you have been born again, God would have you be involved in the great work of world evangelization. And at the heart of it is John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you so much for the great work of missions. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who you sent, really, in reality, as a missionary into a lost world. But Lord, today our, our hearts are contemplating your words when you say, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. I pray that Christians would examine themselves. We know that your word is very plain when it says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. And Lord, we pray, dear God, this week as we focus upon really the great work of the New Testament church until you come. I pray, dear God, that you'd put a burden upon our hearts for a world that is lost in sin, that desperately needs the message that has transformed and changed our lives. Lord, I pray you would speak to our hearts today. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that we would become more aware of those around us that are lost and perishing. But then, Lord, I pray that we would also be more prayerful when it comes to missionaries, that we would give more, that we would pray more, that we would be more supportive, dear God, of the great work that you called the church to do until you come. We pray now you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.